I number these so that at least you know when I'm halfway through, and it gives you an idea when you'll get to go home. So I think we'll uh, just get right into this because today is a special day. <clears throat> How many of you were subjected to some form of April Fool's? Uh... No, you're all too smart, yes. How many of you were subjected but just didn't want to put up your hands the first time? Yeah, just two honest people in the room. Uh, these days I write for the Courier newspaper, but a number of years ago I had an opportunity to do something creative with the Courier because I was marketing a condominium that I was developing in Carisdale. And uh, I decided when I noticed that it was April 1st for the Wednesday edition to use a newspaper to have some fun. So the ad on the left was placed on April 1st, 1998, <clears throat> excuse me, shortly after Prince Charles had come to visit. And what the copy says is that it's rumored that the prince has purchased a condominium in Carisdale, but everyone was being very secretive about it. What I never contemplated was that when my pre-sale buyers received their newspaper that morning, they immediately all phoned my office to say, what is he doing? How dare he sell an apartment to the royal couple? Just think of the increased security charges we're going to have on our monthly fees. <laughs> A year later, I still had two units left. And we were talking about transit. Some things never change. And uh, the conversation was about the SkyTrain going down Camby Street. And I thought perhaps there's an opportunity here to have some fun and profile the project with SkyTrain running along West 41st Avenue. And we did a little image and put it in the paper. And the next day, my daughter came home, and she was laughing. And she said, you'll never guess what, Daddy. One of the girls in my class came to show and tell with a copy of the newspaper to say that the Sky Train was coming to Crofton House. And I said to her, no, it's not really. That's just one of my dad's April Fool's Day jokes. And she said, what's April Fool's Day? Because of course, it's not something we celebrate all over the world. I, I laid low for a few years, but about two years ago, I developed a condominium little development in West Vancouver. And I thought, surely it's time to have some fun with the West Van Denizens. So I ran this ad in the newspaper. <clears throat> it talks about uh, the regional planner, Brent Bartholomew, applauding the proposal. He said, building, he liked the proposal especially to link it to Dundaraven and Ambleside villages with a network of gondolas. <laughs> he noted that far too long, West Vancouver has been an enclave for the rich and very rich. By adding 14,000 new homes in the upper lands, it should be possible to accommodate more lower and middle income households, including the children and parents of the rich and very rich. <laughs> the following week, I had to put in an apology <laughs> because people thought it was serious. Even the Vancouver Sun and a business in Vancouver contacted me to see if we could get some more details. I guess we've reached the stage that we not only believe everything we hear on the internet, we believe everything we read in the newspaper, but we shouldn't. But the Vancouver Sun had the best one. I don't know how many of you remember this, but Five years ago, I have to tell you, I contacted Tiffany Crawford by email because I read the story and it featured an interview with Telford Maynard, who was one of my neighbors in Southlands, and I said, you got me here, Tiffany, this is absolutely brilliant. In fact, it's so brilliant, I need to ask you, is this really an April Fool's Day column or not? We subsequently learned that it was, in fact, a bona fide proposal by the city of Vancouver. <laughs> but as the Metro News reported, it wasn't completed. Okay, 
Let's get on to the matters at hand. I'm going to be suggesting ideas for Vancouver, but I need to make it absolutely clear, and I'm sure most of you agree with me, this is a great city. If it wasn't, we wouldn't all be paying more than 50% of our income to, to live here. <laughs> and indeed, the fact that the city is so unaffordable is a serious, a serious problem for many, many people. But I think we also take some pride in the fact that we are striving to be a more sustainable city. Indeed, the mayor says we're going to become the most sustainable city in the world in 2020. As I think you're going to see tonight, we'll never be the most sustainable city in the world. It's not in our DNA, but it's appropriate to try. Gord, I put this picture in just for you. And I wore a helmet. But as I say, and I'm sure it applies to all of you, as you travel around, you constantly see things that you say, why don't we do that? Or we should do that. So tonight, I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've seen that I keep thinking, maybe we should be doing this or at least trying it. And uh, in a range of different topic areas, as, as you'll see. And I don't expect all of you to agree with everything that I'm going to say, especially those of you who voted no. <laughs> and I'm not even going to ask you to identify yourselves. So here's an observation. When I returned from a, 19, a 2007 trip around the world, somebody said to me, if you had one observation, what would it be? And I said, well, I have two. The first is the world is much more sophisticated than we think it is. You go to the Adriatic and countries and you think that they're third world and they're not. But the other thing is I said, you get in, it's interesting to go to the really exotic places and then start looking for Starbucks and McDonald's. But it's even more interesting sometimes to go to the places that are not exotic, which are very much like us, and then seek out the things that are very different. And so tonight, I'm probably going to dwell more on the latter than the former. And hopefully, you'll agree that some of these things, if not exotic, are at least interesting or unusual. For example, I was in a supermarket in France. And I watched this lady with her little machine. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm just checking everything out. No, I don't know. Have it, do we do this here? I've never seen that. But there in France, People are using these little handheld units so that when they don't, they don't have to line up for 10 minutes and read the National Enquirer like we do. This is something that I like. Architects, and this happened to be in uh, Santiago, Chile, but all over South America and in other parts of the world, architects put their names on their building. Even developers put their names on their building. I put my name on that building in Carisdale. But it's so rare that you actually see an architect sign his work or her work, and I think they should. Germany is one of my favorite countries. We're going to have fun with Germany tonight. How many people here are from Germany? OK. Well, there's one or two things you're going to be a little. Uh, but this, I thought, was impressive. I looked at this toilet, and I thought, it's very unusual. What's going on here? And then I watched it. <laughs> And as you could see, it was designed so that it was automatic, that it cleaned itself. Now, I don't want you to think the whole evening is going to be talking about toilets, but here's another <laughs> toilet story. I arrived at the airport in New Zealand, and I saw this. And I thought, how can you not love a country that has father and son toilets, and presumably there are mother and, mother and daughter toilets in the other? And again, I don't think I've ever seen that in Vancouver. They also have creative license plates. You can't read that at the back. It says, I went to buy the soup, but bought a BMW instead. <laughs> That's their license plate. And while we're on the topic of cars, th those of you who are familiar with French cars and things like the De Chevaux, you know they make wonderful little cars. This is one that I just saw last week. That's in a little two-seater electric car, and it's one seat behind the other, and uh, only the French. 
So now on to some slightly more substantial topics. And I'm going to start to follow up on a study that the Vancouver Foundation issued a couple years ago in which it suggested that a lot of people in our city feel a somewhat sense of isolation. And indeed, many people said we're not as friendly a city as perhaps we ought to be. So I've tried to think, how could we make this a friendlier city? There's no doubt that events like uh, Le Diner en Blanc or uh, the fireworks, they bring tourists to the city, but they also, I think, bring people together. Exactly one year ago today, I spent April Fool's Day in Odessa, Ukraine, and I arrived to discover that there they don't just have a few tricks between t the morning and 12 o'clock. The whole day is a day of celebration for the entire town. And they have parades and skits and all sorts of things. And indeed, it, in a country that was su is suffering, and last April they were suffering, it really brings the people together. Those of you who've been to Buenos Aires, but also even on the streets of Beijing, you see people dancing. And I thought, like, why don't we dance outside, at least in the summertime? I thought it was just wonderful. So, Schlager move. Schlager move? It's the, I couldn't believe my eyes. We were in Hamburg, we went to the station, and there's all these people dressed like this. I said, is this because it's Saturday? <laughs> no, it's a celebration of the 70s. And uh, this isn't necessarily something I want to bring to Vancouver. <laughs> but I love the fact that the people who we often think of as being so stern and severe can do this and have a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, those of you who've been to Palm Springs in February know that it has a, a, a week-long festival celebrating its mid-century architecture. And I think there's an idea. We should perhaps be celebrating some of our Pacific West Coast uh, architecture. The thing is, though, all of these events, they bring together the people of a city. And indeed, I was thinking, you know, if we are striving to be the most sustainable city in the world, maybe Vancouver should start an annual sustainability fair or sustainability festival. Uh, when I was at SFU, we did something like this. And as you can see, th these are from Australia, where cities in Australia have for many years been celebrating sustainability. I didn't know that when I came up with the idea. I just Googled to see what came up. But, so there's an idea. But more importantly, I think we also need to create the spaces around the city that we're lacking in order to accommodate these sorts of events. And you must admit, some of these efforts demonstrate people in Vancouver are pretty desperate to create a few more public spaces. And indeed, compared to many cities, we really are lacking in that area. The other thing is, I believe you can create friendly housing developments, friendly condominiums. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, this is the work of an architect named Ross Chapin in uh, Washington State, and he designs what he calls pocket neighborhoods from generally small, maybe nine to 18 units, but designed in such a way that they, for they force people to have interaction with one another and to get to know one another. And they're not for everybody, but they work very well. And if you ever get a chance, those of you who are architects and planners or interested in this, Go to some of these Chapin communities in Washington State and now spreading and just speak to some of the people. And I copied this idea a little bit for this development I did in, in West Vancouver. But it's not just uh, little ground-oriented units. I believe you could design high-rise buildings, and indeed one is being proposed right now, to incorporate features and uh, to highlight what might you do in Paris uh, on Saturday night, I stayed at a hotel, which I want to recommend, called Citizen M. It's a new concept, and it's basically very, very small units, but the whole place is designed with a certain vibe. And you feel it as soon as you see the, fa the, 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 the mat that says, Citizen M says, nice shoes. Now that's a bit too cute, 
but at least it lets you know you're entering a different kind of place. And indeed, this was the view from the front door. I mean, the lobby was full of people, and it was designed in such a way that you just couldn't help but think this is a lot of fun. And why wouldn't we do this in condominiums or in rental buildings in a, as a way, especially when they're full of people who may well be unattached and hoping not to be for the rest of their lives? The other thing is I go out to Langley and Maple Ridge and I see all these new subdivisions. None of them have little corner stores being incorporated in the beginning the way that older communities used to. And I think it should become mandated because often you get to meet your neighbors at the corner store. When we started the SFU University City community, one of the first things we did was make sure there was a corner store in place before the first residents moved in. Of course, he couldn't pay any rent. Indeed, he, we had to sometimes subsidize his operation. Uh, I tell the story of how I insisted that he have apples and oranges and wooden crates in front of the store. Uh, he said, why? I said, well, because we've got them in the illustrations of what the high street's going to look like. And we don't want to be deceptive. And one day I came along and I noticed, and Ray Spaxman's here tonight, and he was a trustee of the, uh, of the corporation, that they, the, the crates were gone. And I said, what's this? Oh, he says, look, the stuff goes bad, the students steal it. It's too much bother to put it out. I said, no, 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 you have to put it out. So I couldn't take it off his rent because he wasn't paying any rent. So we paid for the apples and oranges just because it made it feel a little more friendly. And neighborhood pubs. And I know there's a lot of conversation. They don't have to be big, raucous places. I, I was born in England where in the evening you'd walk down the street to the corner pub and you'd chat with your friends and so forth. And I think things like that contribute to a more neighborly sense of society. So that's the first one. There's 11 to go. We're a city on the water, and yet when I travel to other places, I think, yes, it's great that we've got the sea bus, but there's so much more we should be doing with our water. For instance, if any of you have been to Sydney, and some of you are probably from Sydney, you know that there's a fabulous network of ferries linking the downtown with the various suburbs and other municipal uh, destinations. This happens to be a solar-powered ferry boat, um, which I was very impressed with, but they're not all like this. The other thing is uh, it links different communities. They, they had the Olympics, it goes to the Olympics Park. We have those little False Creek ferries, but just take a look at these pictures and imagine what we might do. Hong Kong, some of you are from Hong Kong. What a wonderful, I mean, the Star Ferry, I often think, is the best cruise money can buy, uh, given the amount of money you have to pay. But Brisbane, another Australian city, has what they call the City Cat, which goes up and down the river and links people, pulls up to the university. And I've been thinking, you know, yes, we've got a problem getting to people to the university. There's a lot of students, to my mind, who could get to the university by boat. And when people say to me, oh, well, uh, it won't work, you don't have the depth. You could use hovercrafts, vehicles like that, that could pull right up to UBC. So there you are, there's a thought. Yes, it is, the TransLink City Ferry. There's another thing that TransLink, I'm sure, is dying to get into, the ferry business. <laughs> and if you miss the last boat, of course, you've got water taxis and so forth. So I'd like to think that all of you, if you think this is an idea, we should slowly promote it. I've been involved with a piece of property in Port Moody and Anmore, the old Imperial Oil refinery, and one of the things that I've suggested is we should link that community to the new Evergreen Line and to the West Coast Express with a little, modest little ferry. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, and uh, so, that, so those are thoughts. Just There's one way of using the water, but there's more. You know, I've always envied people who live in houseboats. Um, a number of people do it. Uh, there's a development in Ladner some of you may be familiar in. But that's about it. Granville Island, Ladner, a few others in uh, Finn's uh, Slough. But if you go to Holland, you'll see lots of people living on the water and growing marijuana <laughs> <laughs> on their boat in their backyard like this guy. 
But there's some wonderful new developments with these very exquisitely designed detached uh, houseboats all over, the, all over the place. And they're even building townhouse developments on the water. Isn't that? That's kind of a nice picture that the Dutch government provided me with. But I went down, and here's how it looks at grade. I mean, it's quite exquisitely designed, I think. Uh, and interesting in terms of you can have your boat, you can have, uh, you don't need a car in these communities, and it's all connected to public transit. In Hamburg, I went uh, two years ago for an international uh, building exposition, and they created this floating office structure. And again, I know that we don't want to impact the sense of water by ever filling in the water, or putting in too many boats, but I think things like this would both add architectural interest. There was once an architectural firm in Vancouver, today it's called Stantec, Reiner remembers it well, and uh, it was called Wag Barge, Waysman Architectural Group, had a barge in, in Coal Harbor. <coughs> so I leave you with this image to imagine what we might do in certain places. Yes, we have to deal with more tides. By the way, when I was in Holland, the government was doing a lot of development, and I said to one of the officials, I'm so impressed, the government has a lot of land. How come you have so much land? He said, we make it. <laughs> Let's talk about how to make Vancouver even more pedestrian-oriented. And you're going to say, what do you mean, more pedestrian-oriented? we got wonderful walkway systems as it is, and it's true, but... When you go to other places down the pedestrian streets and then you think back to Vancouver, you say, just a second, we're missing. And these are just typical of virtually every city that I go to in Europe uh, has, and often in Asia, has some pedestrian street. I love the story of Curitiba. Some of you may have met or have heard the mayor, Jaime Lerner. He's spoken in Vancouver a couple of times. And he gave a talk about how they made a pedestrian zone. They literally did it overnight on a long weekend. A group of people like you worked together, put up some barricades, and transformed the downtown. And Dove, Lerner said something which you may not be able to read at the bottom, but I think there's some, it's very true. If you want to get something done, start fast. You know, too often we try to work everything out you're never going to get it done. Start fast. But what has happened now is that whole pedestrian network has expanded throughout quite a large part of downtown Curitiba. And, you know, in New Zealand, they respect the pedestrians. Indeed, there's a number of intersections where people cross differently. No, not on their hands and legs. No, they, they can cross all of the traffic lights stop and the intersection is given over to the pedestrians. Now, we used to do this in Vancouver. I wrote a column in The Sun about it and someone said, yeah, a Granville and uh, Granville and Georgia used to be a scramble intersection. And I happened to be working with a New Zealand traffic engineer um, and I asked him, how come you do that in New Zealand and you don't do it here? And he said, well, the problem here was it was slowing up the car traffic. And I thought, uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe this is an idea that we should be bringing back. So European cities, they all have these pedestrian zones. It was interesting, I was in Winnipeg. Winnipeg is promoting walkability in a variety of different ways. We have the Granville Street Mall. And the fact is, it is hardly a successful pedestrian street. But I'd like to think that it, as, as we rethink our attitude towards cars and transportation and the pedestrian, we could start to give over much more of our streets to the pedestrian, that we could become more like Brisbane. This is one of the main streets in the downtown. Or Manila, yes, Manila, Philippines, where they've created a new development uh, in Bonifacio with what they call a pedestrian highway lined with shops, very elegant shops, completely distorted my impression of what the Philippines would be like, lined with public art and so forth. So let's, uh, let's enhance that pedestrian experience. We can do it with planting. 
We can do it with a better paving. I think when you walk on unit pavers, it has a different feel than when you walk on uh, traditional brushed concrete. But let's think about how we can um, enhance the experience here. In Chile, one of the ways they do it is having all of this activity on these very wide sidewalks. In some places, it's probably too late to create wide sidewalks, but in other places, we could do that. Similarly, in Paris, it's wonderful to walk around Paris because there's so much to see. Uh, those of you who've been to Melbourne know how they've created these wonderful uh, bridges, and, and Gord Price has often put together a series of, of, of pedestrian uh, structures around the world. Uh, Moscow, uh, when I arrived in Moscow, the first thing I did was figure out how to get down to Red Square to wander around there. I wanted to be there at midnight, and I, that's when I took this picture. So, like this place, maybe we can start to make the pedestrian king in parts of uh, Vancouver. We could certainly do more. While I'm on the topic of transportation, um, yes, Vancouver has, I think, made great strides when it comes to cycling compared to where we were 10 years or 20 years ago. I saw this in uh, Slovenia, and it got me thinking. In some places, it's just too dangerous to try and put the cyclists on the road, so they put them on the sidewalk. Now, I can hear a lot of people saying, oh, no, that's too dangerous for the pedestrians. But maybe there are some places where this is an idea that makes sense. I saw it in Dublin, Ireland as well, but I couldn't quite figure out where the cyclists were supposed to go there. <laughs> Maybe you can. <laughs> so we've done that. <clears throat> I, uh, I know a lot of people don't ride their bikes because they're worried that they'll get stolen. So it was interesting to see this uh, structure in Chile which has been designed, looks like an old railway car, I thought that was quite clever, um, and it's bicycle storage where you can lock up your bike. Couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this. This is in Amsterdam again, it's an underground parking garage for bikes. And you just take your bike down the ramp and you lock it up down there. One day, when in my will, I'm going to leave my slides of bicycle facilities to the SFU city program, care of Gordon Price. <clears throat> when I was in Turkey, I didn't know how to get around, and I saw these little buses, like little vans, and somebody said, you just take that one, and you get in, and you hand a loony, or the equivalent of a loony, to the passenger in front of you, who hands it over to the driver, and they... They either follow a certain route, but they'll sometimes deviate from the route. And it got me thinking, I'd use transit a lot more if I could get to the transit. But I would be willing to pay for a private shuttle bus in my neighborhood. It would be worth it compared to the cost of parking downtown. So I know that TransLink does offer these little community shuttles in those low density areas that have been built. But there's a lot more potential here, I think, to use these small private and public shuttle buses. It's interesting, um, when I was in Winnipeg, I noticed they have a free downtown shuttle. I thought, that's interesting, because I'd seen the same thing in Auckland, New Zealand. And again, it's just all about changing your attitude to moving around. It's so interesting, the number of people who get on the tram in Portland because it's free. It's a funny thing that you'll just take it for three blocks because it's free, but you wouldn't pay $2.50 to go those three blocks. And uh, if it's raining, you might not walk, so you get in your car and pay to park. One of my favorite bus systems in the whole world, and some of you have no doubt seen this before, is again in Curitiba, Brazil. That bus looks a little odd. And that's because it operates differently than most buses that we're familiar with. That's the platform. And the bus pulls up to the platform. And you pay your fare on the platform. And so in a way, it's like going on a tram or a train, but it's done with buses. And what Jamie Lerner said was, we just simply couldn't afford to put a tram system. But it was a lot less expensive 
but almost as efficient to have this sort of system. And they have their own designated uh, tracks or routes, lanes in, in many parts. In some areas they're not, but in many areas they are. After I saw this, I became a, a, a fan of the possibility of a rapid bus system. Of course, I would never suggest that we should have something like this along West Broadway. I noticed in Santiago, Chile, that sometimes you pay when you get on the bus, but sometimes you actually pay on the sidewalk. And that's at the very busy, busy stops. And again, it makes so much sense because it helps keep the traffic moving along. In Singapore, which is one of my favorite cities, I wrote a column after I visited Singapore in the Vancouver Sun, lauding the many things I saw and liked. And one of my friends wrote back to me. He said, I don't think Singapore is anything more than a large hotel lobby. <laughs> Other people wrote to me saying, how dare you be so laudable about a place that is so repressive. One man kept writing to me, and I just didn't even want to answer him. He wrote about three times, and finally I read his email. It turned out he was the assistant to the editor of the Singapore Strait Times. And they wanted permission to reprint my article from the Vancouver Sun, and Ken West had told them to get in touch with me. I got paid more to have it printed in the Singapore Strait Times, <laughs> significantly more than in the Vancouver Sun. What was fun, though, was to go online, and you can do this, to see the response in Singapore to my column, because one of the things I mentioned was how clean everything was. And one person wrote, he's obviously never been to our development. Uh, we've talked a lot about trams in the last little while. I love trams. I lived in Toronto for many years. I didn't particularly like the streetcars then, but now I realize they're, they're certainly efficient. This is uh, Montpellier, France, where they're decorated as only the French can decorate them. And they run, like in many other places, on tracks which are sometimes pavement, but sometimes just grass. And again, can you imagine this going down uh, some of the streets around Vancouver, Metro Vancouver? Melbourne has got a wonderful system. Virtually all the European, not all, but most European cities that I've visited have had trams. They've had them for many years. If I come back, I'm going to give you a presentation. I'll include what it's like to get on a tram in Sofia, Bulgari, and the lady who comes to collect your fare. And believe me, if you saw this lady, you'd say TransLink should hire her. Nobody would ever evade their fare. <laughs> in Dublin, they just installed a new system. I thought they were magnificent. And again, just look how low the cars are to the platform and so forth. Hong Kong is probably, I think, my favorite city when it comes to different modes of transportation. Oh, I, just to show you there, you can't really see it, but across the top there, that blue line is just letting you know how far you've got, and you can watch TV and so forth uh, as it moves along. But there's a lot of the double-decker buses and double-decker trams, and again, I've often wondered why don't more places do these double-decker trams. We do have double-decker trains. I watched this situation for about half an hour until my wife said, come on, we're on holiday, let's go. I just wanted to see who won. <laughs> um, you know, we talk about road pricing and we think of uh, Singapore and we think of London, but lots of places are doing it. I was invited down to San Diego by the School of Architecture at the Catholic University and the professor was driving me around, and on the right, that's the little transporter that she had on her dashboard, and there you are. She's paying for the public transit by the use of her car. And I think we have to look at road pricing, and of course, we also have to vote yes. <clears throat> for those of you who are not at the yes rally tonight. <clears throat> so, there's been a lot of conversation lately about planning, especially planning in Vancouver. And I did uh, coin a term that I, 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 I stand by, which is I grew up to learn that form follows function. 
And in Vancouver, increasingly, I sadly have to say, form follows finance. And if you can get a few more dollars by permitting a few more floors, then it's money to go towards social housing or other worthwhile causes. But as an architect, it really is uh, troubling for me to sometimes see the kind of resulting building forms and the juxtaposition of developments that somehow don't seem to be in the right place. And I just noted David Galanders is in the audience. He's the person who's really responsible for University City. <laughs> uh, I just helped him. But this whole notion of how do we go about planning the city, I think, is, is a topic that we need to have a broader conversation about. And Ray Spaxman's here. I, I actually tried to come up with a, with a little quotation because I was based on some of the feedback I've been seeing as we talk about how might we go about creating a city plan. You have to balance form and uses and process because if people don't feel they've been adequately involved in the process, the plan is not likely to be accepted. And then there's always this notion of trying on one hand wanting certainty, but at the same time wanting flexibility. And I met with a reporter from Korea this week and tried to explain to him in broken Korean what discretionary zoning is. And I said, you balance flexibility with certainty because the bad developers want certainty and the good developers want flexibility. So when I think about how places have been designed or the years have formed, you can't help but think some places there's just a wonderful continuation of materials and color. Jerusalem comes to mind. Uh, Geiselmeer comes to mind. I was in Marrakesh last week, the Red City. That building on the left at the top is one of the few buildings that's not red, uh, but uh, the, there's a consistency of scale. All the buildings there, I think, are about five stories or less. When you go to many other European cities, to, well, you know, that's Prague. That's the Frank Gehry building, by the way, <clears throat> that was designed to fit in. But there's a consistency of scale. There are some neighborhoods that may have high rise, as is the case in Paris. Um, I took this picture from the boat, I think, going by. But there is a high rise district. But you don't see high rises juxtaposed with that wonderful mid-rise carpet of buildings. Now, we have developed a, a unique, indeed, these Korean business people came to learn about Vancouverism. And they, they knew what it was. They said, it's a tower and a podium. And not only do we like it here, they like it in Dubai so much, they copied it. <laughs> Except the top of the buildings are slightly different. In fact, a group for who did the North Shore Falls Creek actually went to Dubai. If you look carefully, you'll see they use exactly the same railing details. <clears throat> so I think we've created a very attractive downtown, relatively speaking. And the other thing that I think we've started to do is to create a reasonable overall regional context, a regional planning context with designated town centers and so forth. We haven't been as successful as we'd like in terms of attracting commercial activity, but it's starting. You know, Metro Town is starting to get more office and so forth. But I think Vancouver needs more than a zoning map. It does need an overall, a, a, a better overall plan. Whether you call it a city plan or whatever, I think we can discuss that. And where would we discuss it? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. But what I think we need is to start to see, if you go back, Looking at all those white areas, and I think it's about 50% of the city's residential zoning is, is all single family. And yes, you can have three units on each lot, but that's not enough. We need to have more housing choice. I've often thought that all those arterials could be rezoned, pre-zoned for a mix of uh, townhouses, and then when you get into the commercial areas, mixed use buildings, and then the row behind the commercial arterial, that could become slightly higher density and then transition into the single family. And the city should just work on this with the communities. There will be some variations, of course, and then pre-zone it so that you don't have to keep coming forward with a rezoning application every time. 
And, and some of these smaller buildings, little mid-rise buildings like I saw in Hamburg, this was taken from the water. I'd like to see this kind of variety too. <laughs> They're all asleep. <laughs> That's, that's not Photoshop, that's a real subdivision in Markham. We must never do that in Metro. We are doing it though, there's parts of Metro that aren't that dissimilar. Uh, you just drive along the road and you look up on the hill and you see that. And again, why isn't this a mix of singles and some apartments and some townhouses and a corner store? That we should be starting new subdivisions and new planning areas with that mix. And it would be nice to have some folly. And this, uh, this is a street I discovered. I couldn't believe it. Nobody told me about it. I was walking along. And all of a sudden, I realized the buildings on one side of the street were the mirror image of the buildings on the other side of the street. <clears throat> and so as he went down, they were painted the same color, and it looked like that. Sadly, this was destroyed. Uh, uh, in the earthquake, but I, I hope it'll be rebuilt if it hasn't already. So where are we going to continue this conversation? We can't just do it on Wednesday nights here. What we need, and this is the, uh, an idea that Ray Spaxman brought to a number of us many years ago, is a, a place that we'll call an urbanarium. And it'll be like Singapore City Gallery, where there'll be a giant model of the city and a place to have displays on different topics. Uh, when I was there, they were talking about lighting the city and so forth. And I think that that's the kind of thing that we need in this city so we can continue to have these sorts of discussions. So I'm almost halfway through. Let's talk about landscaping. And I admit, I've got a little bit of a hang-up on this because I like gardening and I like landscaping. And I don't consider this landscaping. Although no matter how many times I phone 311 or send notes to people at City Hall, it stays exactly the same. This isn't in some isolated little place. The one on the left is on uh, Broadway near Burrard. Some of you recognize it. And the one on the right, that's, that's, that's at Georgia and Granville. And like, I can't understand why would anybody allow this it's interesting, if you go over the south end of the new Burrard Street, the, the new Burrard Street intersection at the end where we spent millions of dollars and maybe it's good, all I know is they paved the road and then they came in and they chopped it up and they put in a planter. You wouldn't know this because you, you would be on the sidewalk with your bike. But then they put in this planter and they put in the soil and this was last November but they never planted anything. <laughs> and then the weeds started to grow. And today as I came over, I said, oh, now I understand. It's a sustainable landscape. <laughs> it's going to be all weeds. And I'm, and I'm honestly not sure if it's an April Fool's Day joke, whether somebody's going to come along from the engineering department, because it's engineering who looks after the streets and tear out all those weeds and plant it nicely, or at least put in some grasses or something. But right now, take a look at the south end of the Burrard Street Bridge. It's worth a special trip because, I mean, look at this. I'm sure there's some political statements being made with these red flowers here in Hanoi, but it sure was pretty. I was in this place and I took a cruise from Moscow to uh, St. Petersburg. We stopped off and I saw this garden It said 997. And I said, is that some kind of code? No, they said, that's the age of our town. Every year we plant its age in flowers. And I thought, isn't that nice? Surely somewhere in Queen Elizabeth Park, in, in uh, 86 we were 100, so Maybe for next year, as a birthday present to the cities, they'll, they'll start a garden that uh, celebrates the age of the city and planting. Budapest, you know, a gray city, you think of it. No, the downtown, they've got lovely urban planting. Anyone here who's from Hong, uh, Tokyo or knows many Japanese cities along the side of the street, there's this lovely, dense planting. I, I, think, I think it enhances the place. 
Um, again, this is in France, uh, where green walls are being built all over. This happens to be on a little bridge and an overpass and fountains. And I thought, boy, isn't this beautiful? There's a program, a Canadian program, that encourages communities to think about more and more planting called Communities in Bloom. And I remember Greg Halsey Brandt once proudly saying that Richmond had won something. Because if you go down number two road, um, you'll see how beautifully uh, the planting boulevards are. Now, I'm sure some of the people in the sustainability group in Vancouver would scorn at it, but it's lovely. And I think people appreciate it and people would pay for it. I will tell you that I feel personally responsible. I worked on the study from the Canby Street Bridgehead to City Hall. I was on a team with a city planner who had left named Ralph Siegel and Perkins, the architectural firm. And at that time, there were lots of wires overhead. And as part of our study, I wanted a boulevard up the middle so it would be like University Avenue in Toronto with planting and maybe even some fountains. And I suggested in my report that if the city did this, it would increase the property values along Canby Street sufficiently that the property taxes would more than offset the cost. And one rainy Sunday afternoon, the phone rang, and it was then Alderman Gordon Campbell. And he said, I'm reading your report. Geller, do you really believe this shit? <laughs> I said, yes, I really do. Anyway, the city approved it, <clears throat> and the first new development was a Wendy's. <laughs> but eventually, we've got those nice new developments like the Rise, and I feel vindicated. And the wires have gone underground and so forth. I would love us to be more like Chicago. And I've even sent messages to uh, Sadhu Johnson to say, you're from Chicago. You're interested in sustainability. Why can't we do stuff like this? And he says, oh, it's, it's not the city that does it, it's the merchants. So I went and spoke to the, one of the business improvement areas, and they said, yes, we contribute, but the city also contributes. But I think downtown Chicago is absolutely magnificent, and uh, I'd love us to do a little bit of that. The other thing is, and it was on the news yesterday, uh, but even before I put this slide in the presentation, <clears throat> I'd heard we're losing trees in this city. And I've, I, when I was in France, I once saw a tree and it had a little plaque at the bottom and it said it was planted in memory of someone. I thought, why don't we have a program in Vancouver where everybody could pay to plant a tree in honor of somebody? I could, somebody could plant a tree in honor of this talk. <laughs> I know it wouldn't be any of you, but, <laughs> but we could plant, David Galanders will tell you, I had a similar silly idea at SFU. I saw dedication pavers along a sidewalk. It was so nice to walk along the sidewalk and see all these little pavers in honor of our daughter, Christina, who finally graduated from high school and so forth. <laughs> but I think we should have a program. And if, if the park board can't afford to plant all the trees, I'll pay. And a lot of you may not pay, but a lot of people I know would gladly pay to plant a tree, especially Jewish people, because we all grew up planting trees in Israel. OK, we're halfway through. I, oh, God, I've got to hurry up. Um, becoming a more creative city. You know, Richard Florida gets a lot of credit. But there's another guy, Charles Landry. And if you're interested in this, you should read his book. It's fascinating. Um, we're not on the list. I, just in case you wondered what are considered the most creative cities in the world, I, I, put, I was wondering myself, so I put this, I found this. I think there's some wonderful cities that are not on this list, but uh, I certainly agree with Amsterdam and Berlin and uh, Stockholm and uh, Melbourne, London, New York, Paris. Barcelona, those of you who've been to Barcelona know it's a fantastic place. Um, and they've created a whole tourism industry out of celebrating their art and architecture. And yes, it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. You go there to see these wonderful Gaudi buildings. Warsaw, though. I thought Warsaw was going to be so gray. It's a beautiful city, you know, focus in art and culture and very, very lively. Valencia, another amazing place. They've, they've really spent a lot of money on what they call a cité 
well, they don't call it Cite because they're Spanish, but it's this city of arts and sciences. If you haven't seen it, here's a photograph of it from the air. That's not a Photoshop. That's what it really looks like. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I wouldn't advocate spending this much money on any building, but it gives a great civic pride. Warsaw, Moscow, another city. A lot of the European cities have these plaques that sort of celebrate what the town looked like at a certain time or a building. It's wonderful to, to see these sculptures in the street. And if you haven't been in the subways in Moscow, here's just one shot, and I've got like 140 shots like that. That's a subway station. I want you to compare that with the station of 49th in Camby. <laughs> you know, you go to creative cities, you see public art throughout the cities. This happens to be Chandigarh, which you remember Corbusier created. But it's not just big, expensive things. This is Bratislava. I was going down on a cruise, and I noticed somebody put some color on the underside of the bridge. And I thought, it just makes such a difference. Or the electrical boxes. Some of, may, of you may recognize those green ones on the left. That's our pride and joy, the Olympic Village. I kept writing to the city saying, why don't you decorate these green boxes? They're awful. You go, they're, they're fading. I couldn't bring myself to go today to check to see in case they had painted them and I'd have to take the slide out. But check, those of you who are near there. I couldn't understand why you wouldn't think of wanting to do something. So we put up that ridiculous, I know you love it, but that ridiculous big bird, but we don't do something with these obvious canvases. So if we're going to become a creative city, we have to do more for the arts and we have to do more for artists. And I'm not going to get into the debate about where the art gallery should be or shouldn't be, but we do need more facilities for the arts. Here's quickly a proposal that I worked on with a gentleman, JP, who was here earlier, I'm told. This is the idea put forward by a guy called Herb Auerbach, based on the Cité des Artistes. It's an artist's residence and studio in Paris, where students come from all over the world. They've built similar facilities in Omaha, in Banff, Berlin, and uh, there's another one, converted buildings. And I was involved in doing a little study to see would it make sense to do something like that in Vancouver, perhaps in the downtown east side, connected to the SFU School for Contemporary Arts. I think it would be a wonderful facility, and I thought if I mentioned it to you, one of you will run with the idea. All right, eight, we're moving along quickly now. I'm gonna give some suggestions to the city on how it can become more sustainable, which of course they would say is preposterous, because if, but anyway. The fact is it's not in our DNA to be sustainable. I'm not even gonna ask you how many of you let the water run while you clean your teeth, but I know at least I'm not the only one. Or when we leave rooms, we leave the lights on. They don't, well, yes, they don't leave the water running in Australia because sometimes they've gone for years without water. Leaving the lights on? I thought this was cute. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm catering to a younger audience here, Gord. <laughs> yeah, but this is another thing. Go all over Vancouver, the most sustainable, greenest city in the world to want to be, our escalators are running all the time. You go to Germany, the escalators aren't running all the time. They run when there's people using them. Or in our hotel room in Paris, the lights aren't always on in the corridor. The lights come on when you come out of the elevator. There's a low level light, then they come on. It's such a simple thing, but we don't even think about doing that. If you do want to know about greenest city in the world, Freiburg, Germany is definitely one of my candidates. I mean, this is a slide you can study. But I mean, the whole town is really focused about green living and green ideas, and it's entrenched in their DNA. It was the first city in, in Germany to have a pedestrian zone downtown, like 60 years ago. This is one of the new suburbs. It's called Reiselfeld. It's a transit-oriented suburb that's been built from scratch. And it really is a showcase of sustainability, if I can use that uh, glove term. Another one, Vauban. 
this. I, I, I waited for hours to get this train with this particular combination of colors to match the colors on the building. So I want you to appreciate that. <laughs> and the Green City Hotel, I would have stayed at the Green City Hotel, but the lady at the front desk couldn't tell me what made it a green hotel. But this is interesting. They've undertaken a program to retrofit all their older apartment buildings. And they're making them like very, very efficient, almost passive house uh, standards. But this, you don't need to go to Freiburg to learn about this. You just have to go to Toronto. Because I was on a panel with the former mayor, and he gave me a copy of this book um, and talked about, and it was the first time I heard the term green color, green color jobs. Right? White collar, blue collar, and green jobs related to the environmental uh, community. So they've got a program in Toronto because they've got a lot of these old buildings to upgrade. But here, this is my final sustainability thing. I was looking at the real estate listings and I saw these little rainbow charts. And um, they are every, it's the law in Europe that every time you sell a used or new house, you have to give its energy consumption rating. Isn't that interesting? So I think we should do that here too. Um, some of you may have heard that I didn't like this building. And it wasn't because I don't like interesting architecture. It's just that I didn't think this building fit very well with the historic CP station across the road. But I would like to talk very briefly about architectural variety. This, by the way, is another approach to relating a new building and an old building that I saw in Amsterdam, where they literally built the new building over the old building in a way that I thought was very respectful. But there is a need for more interesting buildings. And so here's just a few interesting buildings. This one is called the soft house, and it's because that wall just changes shape depending on where the sun is. I thought it's kind of neat. Just to prove that I like weird things, those of you who bank with ING, this is where some of your money went. That's their head office. How can you not love a city that allows a bank to build a head office like that? Compare that with the HSBC building. You know, we've started to talk about using more color. There's so much potential. Uh, this again happens to be in Hamburg, but we're starting to use a bit more color. There's nothing wrong with this if it's done right. This is a fee simple row house development. Each unit is built individually. And uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but I think it's kind of interesting. But the concept of just building a little six meter wide house next to another six meter wide house with a certain style I think is terrific. I saw this building with faces on it. I said, who are these people? They said, they're the people who built the building. Again, different mindset, intriguing idea. Not sure I necessarily like it, but I like the out of the box thinking. Now, some of you have probably been over to the art gallery or you're gonna go over to the art gallery to see the Herzog and Miron uh, exhibition. This is their building. It was uh, still under construction when I was there. This is their new Philharmonic Hall in Hamburg. I won't mind if they don't do a copy of this in Vancouver. <laughs> Those wall panels are kind of like glassy plastic. Oh, I don't know. How's that? Talk about that later. You know, when you think of Amsterdam, you don't think of stuff like this, but there's a whole new downtown of Amsterdam, a business center, and it's interesting in the daytime, but it's fabulous at nighttime. And so I was going to do a whole section on night lighting, but I knew it would upset those of you who can't wait for Earth Hour every year. <laughs> but I am here to pitch the idea that we should be afraid to use more light and color at night. Because we can, even in an energy efficient, uh, through an energy efficient lens. So this is, these are pictures from the Shanghai Expo. 
And World's Fairs, you should all go to World's Fairs if you ever can, because you see the most marvelous stuff. But this is what I think the future is. Well, it's already the present in many Asian cities. But I think it's worth having a conversation about are we prepared to allow some more color and light in downtown Vancouver? And those of you who know Hong Kong, I mean, I spend hours. I've got about 25 pictures of this building because every few minutes, some of you know it, it changes color. I think it's the Star, star Ferry Building. And they do actually have star on it at some point. And of course, at night in the summer in Hong Kong, the whole city just becomes a light show. And it's absolutely fantastic. All right, three to go. Healthier, safer. I went to a conference in 2003 called uh, New Partners for Smart Growth. And all of the program was filled with doctors. And I thought, all oh, these pretentious academics. And it turned out they weren't pretentious academics. They were real doctors. Now, I just say that to upset those people in the room with PhDs. <laughs> but in fact, the theme of the conference was how planners could design healthy communities. And I met this man there, Dan Burden, who does walking audits of places. He teaches people in cities how to design straight, uh, safer streets and safer pedestrian areas. And it's a fascinating wet thing that he does. The irony is that today Vancouver, thanks to Larry Frank and a few other people, is in fact one of the leading voices in, in the community, the international community, when it comes to designing healthy communities. And indeed, I was very proud when University City was selected for a segment of David Suzuki's uh, The Nature of Things for an episode on how planning if you plan a city properly, it can reduce obesity. And this was just ideas I heard at that conference. But if you go up to University City, you'll see that some of the things we did were you know, these big landscape curb bulges before anybody else was allowed to do it. And uh, integrating transportation and uh, residential living. And when people moved into their unit, instead of getting a glass champagne bowl, they got a pedometer. But the idea was to think more about, th about that. Just like this building in Germany, where the staircase isn't some awful concrete thing hidden. The staircase is designed in a way that you might actually use it. And that's why German people tend to be thinner than American people. But here's a question as we talk about safety. <laughs> what do you think of the idea of video cameras? One of the things, though, that I learned from this conference is the idea that in, in addition to doing environmental impact assessments, when we're looking at projects, we should do health impact assessments. And I thought that was an intriguing idea. I put this, I just found this online, but this is the Adler School. I want to give a plug for the Adler School because I just uh, came off the Board of Trustees in Chicago because they have a campus here. Um, but it's a school, do any of you, you know about Adler? It's a school of psychology, but is very interested in community psychology. All right, this is my little personal hang up. I really hate bubble gum on the sidewalks and people throw their cigarette butts. I'm the only one, but I hate it. Yeah. Now, before I criticize Vancouver anymore, I do want to point out we're very good compared to most cities in the world when it comes to controlling graffiti. Freiburg may be the greenest city in the world, but it's not the cleanest city in the world. But it's not Dublin and Ireland. They've had a huge campaign to try and get people to think about keeping the city clean. It says if you behave like a piece of filth, that's how the world sees you. Can you imagine putting up a poster like that in Vancouver? People would say, that, that, that's, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> Litter is disgusting, so are those responsible. I, I agree with that. It's on the buses. It's Hong Kong is very similar, too. Again, just be respectful. Curitiba, I saw this. One of them is Sticko. I told everybody, isn't it wonderful? They got a special garbage can just for chewing gum. And somebody said, no, that's Spanish for plastic. 
Galway, another Irish city. Talk about cigarette butts, the harm they do. Cigarette butts are not biodegradable. They harm marine and animal life, and they account for a large percentage of public litter in Galway. No butts. Dogs. The fine is up to 1,900 euros. By the way, I, I did a column in The Courier today mentioning I was coming here tonight, and one of my readers wrote to me and said, that's another thing. In Europe, the Europeans can't believe about our attitude towards dogs. In Europe, you take your dogs on public transit, you can take your dogs to restaurants, you can take your dogs into stores. So I said, okay, I'll mention that tonight. I'm not gonna ask you how many of you think it's a great idea. You know, we always criticize Singapore because they don't let you chew gum. It's not that they don't let you chew gum. What it was is they don't like you throwing your gum all over the seats or on the ground. But it's not just, uh, it's not just um, Singapore. Again, I think this is Galway or somewhere, but 150 euro fine. Singapore has a competition every year among, for all the residents of the public housing to see who lives in the cleanest project. And I wrote to Shane Simpson and said, Shane Ramsey and said, why don't we do that here? You could give every resident $1,000 in the winning building and you'd be way ahead in terms of maintenance cost savings and think about the sense of pride that it engenders in the residents of these buildings. So far he hasn't taken me up on it. But at SFU, we did take a, a, a little gamble and we bought the first solar powered garbage compactor in, Vancouver, in, in Canada. And we got, these are all the crews from uh, CTV and CBC and everywhere. We got more publicity for this garbage compactor than we did for the entire town. <laughs> but you know, there's another approach to uh, garbage. And if you go to Holland, this is what the garbage cans look like because you put your garbage in and it's a huge receptacle and then it only needs to be emptied much more rarely by these special trucks. And they're trying to develop and introduce that idea here. In Ireland, I just went into a town, I saw the sign, and it had won a tiny, tidy towns award. God, I thought, somebody else, that's my kind of place. The, a winner of the tidy town award. <laughs> and one evening we were in uh, Slovenia, and they were actually doing some theater about cleaning up the streets as part of heightening awareness and getting people to clean. So I'm almost done. And this is what this is all about at the end of the day, is thinking about how do we engender pride. And five years in a row, this is of course 2011. We haven't been number one since 2011. We've been close. We're certainly one of the most livable cities. But you know, lately, people aren't that happy in Vancouver. I mean, I think this transit referendum is doing a lot of harm, but there's just a lot of griping. You just, I feel a lot of griping. People aren't as happy, I think as they should be. They care, they do care, I agree. One of the areas where I think people are, are concerned, and myself included, is the downtown east side. I think we feel a mixture of disappointment and uh, despair and, uh, and, and sorrow, often, for the people who are living there. I recently got involved in a Biennale initiative to install a piece of public art called Let's Heal the Divide. And I thought it was an intriguing initiative. Gordon was involved with it as well. The whole question is what role public art might play in trying to heal the divide between the downtown east side and the rest of the city. And I wanted to give uh, some attention to this piece. It's on the wall of Vancouver Community College. Uh, Tony Latour is the artist. But obviously, art on its own isn't going to do it. So I just wanted to conclude with some of the things that I've been talking about. I, I think if we had to look at one city for lessons, it is Amsterdam. I mean, it happened to be number one on that list, but there's so many things that they're doing there that I think we could emulate, but not just Amsterdam. So yes, we can certainly continue to promote cycling. I think it's no longer a fringe thing. It's very, very real but we need the infrastructure so your bike doesn't get stolen and so you don't feel that it's too dangerous. I'd like just to create more colorful buildings and interesting walkable communities like some of these new German transit-oriented subdivisions. We can make better use of our waterways. This is an electric uh, little tourist boat that cruises around. Why don't we have something like that 
here, especially if it's electric. Um, some of you may remember Chuck Brook. He moved to the south of France. Peasant asked, they have this little festival. We need more festivals. I think, I think they, they bring people together. And yes, let's try and create some more pedestrian streets in the city because they're delightful. They really are. We need to get some tram lines built, and not just in Surrey, but elsewhere around the region, including parts of Vancouver as well. And I think it's probably time for us to get a new city hall. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to demolish a portion of the city hall. It's kind of ironic that we've got money to demolish or seismically upgrade the planning department, but we don't have money for the schools. Montpellier, we may not have to spend as much money as Jean Nouvel spent on behalf of Montpellier, but I think Vancouver is ready for a new city hall. Is when it comes to sustainability, let's do more with less. That's one of the things that I think the Dutch do very well. And let's plant trees and landscape and, uh, and keep the streets clean. So yes, it's a great city. I think we all feel that way. But I hope you'll agree that some of these ideas indeed may make it an even greater city. Thank you very much.